My name is Robin Henneke, and I am a game designer and a producer and the co-founder of a company called Phenomena, which is independent in San Francisco. We make games. And before we talk, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you to the organizers of this conference, um, all of the sponsors and speakers from today. Ten years, can you really believe it? And uh, I, like Ian, want to take a little trip in a time machine and go back 10, 12 years to the time when he and I were both in grad school, about the same time we were trying to choose our careers, um, and I chose games. Uh, and think about what the world was like and how I ended up standing in front of you today. So uh, in 2002 and 2003, around the same time that Ian was talking about going into the academic field and doing persuasive games, um, commercial video games were mostly successful on the PC, but the console space was kind of blowing up. And a new generation of living room games was happening. Um, and just for reference, uh, this is IGN's top game list for 2002, the winner of which was Battlefield 1942, the original version made by Electronic Arts. Um, I don't know if any of you played it, but it was pretty badly. Uh, people knew that games could make money and that they could be a place to have dialogue about something, but the concept of indie games or games for change, as Ian said, was totally yeah. absent. You know, we weren't really talking about it like that. And I was actually studying computer science. Uh, and robotics, and I was teaching myself game design by doing random stuff like talking to game developers and participating in events like the Indie Game Jam. Uh, this is a photo of me from 2002. Uh, Indie Game Jam was one of the first game jams ever. Game jams didn't happen back then. It's just a totally crazy idea. Um, I was really interested in AI and simulation, and so it's probably no surprise that I got recruited to go work on The Sims. Will Wright suggested that perhaps that was my dream job was being a game designer. And uh, later in the fall, I became the lead designer on a game for a new console called The Revolution, which ended up being called the Wii. <laughs> and uh, I worked on this game called My Sims. In the game, there was a little town of people and they were kind of sad. And you could make them happier by building objects and houses for them out of blocks and pieces that you found in their environment. Um, just for reference, IGN's top game of 2005, the year that I started working on My Sims, was God of War. Uh, in 2007, I actually moved from the San Francisco Office of Electronic Arts down to Los Angeles to work on a game that was conceived by Steven Spielberg called Boom Blocks. Um, the game focused on the simple fun that kids and parents can have together, knocking down uh, simulated blocks and little simulated characters with funny voices. Um, like My Sims, it had a creative component. You could actually build uh, your own puzzles, and in the second version of the game, you could actually share your puzzles online with other players. We had a ton of really creative stuff that was done with this game. And again, for reference, uh, IGN's top game of 2007 was Super Mario Galaxy, which came out for the Wii and was a huge hit. And Boombox actually won a BAFTA, so it was recognized as being something that was interesting, even though it was a little different from what was out there. In 2009, uh, I left Electronic Arts to become independent. I went to work at that game company where I was the executive producer of a game called Journey. Um, it took three years to make it. Um, IGN's top game of 2009, uh, the year that we started working on this, was Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, which is an exploration game in which you shoot a lot of people in the face. <laughs> We released Journey in March of 2012, um, and we were not really sure how it would do. For those of you who are not familiar with the game, in Journey you walk across a desert. You start off by yourself, and then over time you are connected with other players that are playing. There's no voice or text chat. It's totally anonymous, and you can choose to walk with someone else to the end, or you can choose to go it alone, much like real life. Much like real life. And um, for reference, IGN's top game of 2012 was Journey. So even though the game cost a fraction of what these other titles that I mentioned cost to make, um, we swept the Commercial Games Awards. This is us winning uh, the VGA's uh, Spike TV Awards. Um, we won a game at Di a bunch of awards at Dice, uh, including Game of the Year. That's a show put on mostly by major publishers who spend like a lot of money on the games that they make. And uh, we won a bunch of BAFTAs, so many that they almost tipped over the table. The games that keep getting mentioned over and over in this conference were also nominated for the Independent Games Awards. These were games that, as Ian said, were games in their own right, but they were recognized by our community as communicating something very meaningful and very important 
to players um, and to developers themselves. Um, Baby Castles actually did a really great job of summarizing, summarizing some of the most recent advances in this particular field, and I think you can check out their list on the website. You should totally check it out. Basically what I'm saying is that things are fucking fantastic right now for us. Like, as a community of people, everyone in this room has an opportunity to make a difference. Um, so what happened? Well, back in 2009, when I first started working on Journey, I actually was on a, another uh, speaking panel sort of thing with, with Ian, uh, put on by Santa Cruz, and I gave a talk about triple E games, emotional, uh, expressive, elegant games, games that would uh, sort of explore a landscape different from what we were seeing in commercial games. And really what I was talking about was Journey, but I couldn't say that at the time. Um, I wanted to describe several axes for evaluating games, uh, starting with a general level of simplicity or complication, so elegance versus Baroque, uh, and then evaluating how directed the game experience was. Was it expressive and let me do what I want, or was it incredibly scripted? And finally, how much it engaged people on a level of deep feeling. Was it a rational, systems-based game where you were trying to solve problems with your mind, or was it something that really engaged your deeper feelings about yourself and other people around you? Um, and I went through a bunch of games that I thought fit in the spectrum and asked what would happen if you made a game on the very edge of Triple E. And I think with Journey, we did that. And it was incredibly rewarding for us as a development team, and it was rewarding for the players, and it was rewarding for all of the people that played it um, to give us that feedback that they enjoyed it. Um, so really what I think happened is in the time that Ian and I started this journey till now, players themselves have started to ask the same question. What happens on the boundaries of game design? And what could we be, what could we be doing there? How could we be playing there? Um, on platforms like Steam and iOS and Android, we see these games emerging. Um, at the same conference where I gave this talk, Ian also gave a pretty sobering discussion <laughs> about the fact that as games were democratized and platforms were democratized and more and more people could make video games, they would get crappier and crappier. And in a way, I think what you see is that you have the best of both worlds. You have a lot of content out there, but then you have things like Journey and Card Life and Dysphoria coming out and getting recognized. So in a way, we see that even though one story has become true, the other has also become true. Um, now more than ever, I think, developers uh, are from a large swath of existence, and it's getting bigger every day, and the games that we're giving voice to are changing. And contrary to what you may have heard earlier today, I don't think that you need huge production budgets to get at these feelings. In fact, I think that the things that are being made in our community right now that are most impactful, that are most earnest, are actually designed to be elegant. They're designed to have a high impact at a low cost to the developer and to the audience. They're designed to make points in a way that respects the developer's time and also the player's time without a lot of extra crap that you don't need. The key isn't money or slick graphics, it's curiosity. I founded a company at the beginning of this year because I was fascinated by the idea of making games for the curious and making games that could make a difference. Um, my co-founder, Martin Middleton, also worked on Journey, and at the end of that production, we had some fundamental beliefs about how we would structure a company, should we ever find anyone crazy enough to work with us and help us make video games for a living. Um, we wanted to work on some big ideas, and we wanted to do some experimental research type games. But we also really wanted to spend about 20% of our time as a company giving back, giving back to San Francisco, the state of California, giving back to the people who played our games in some way. Um, and in a way, we thought, well, maybe we'll do one of those games for change things. Uh, but we weren't really sure how that was going to happen. And then almost out of the blue, a project fell into our lap, a collaboration uh, with the Play for Change Lab here in New York City, NSF and UC Davis, looking at taking data from a pedometer to get kids to be more excited about getting active in their lives. It's not a very fancy game. The concept isn't even really about teaching kids about how to exercise or what to eat. It's not didactic or an oration about behavior in the way that Ian was describing. And it's 
basically just a web browser game because the kids that we're working with are at high risk. They don't have access to a lot of technology. They have to be able to get at this game and play it. And what's more, they have to want to play it. So the barrier has to be very low and the feedback has to be quite high. What we decided to do with this game is focus on the feeling of exploration. At seventh and eighth grade, these kids are being exposed to a world that doesn't really give them very many choices. Choices about where to go, choices about what to eat, choices about how to behave. They were in a little bit of a box. And what we wanted to do was to give them a game and a game development experience that would get them outside that box and get them to think about hacking their own lives. Our idea was to develop a collaborative environment where kids had their own colony, but they also had a colony that they were collaborating with where they would be constantly trying to gather resources and harvest them and then trade them and have a conversation about the mechanics themselves, which the underlying conversation was a conversation about movement in their own lives and the way that they worked. This is because the research itself was about discovering what kids do. The research and the researchers that we're working with are not convinced that they know the answer to these problems. They're curious about what's happening first. And because we decided to focus on this exploration, we were able to push it down into every aspect of the game, from turning the tiles over to building out new technology for your base, and discovering and caring for creatures that help you as you expand, and hopefully caring for the people inside of your colony so that you can be the number one colony when the system ends. Every part of this process has been iterative. We go to Davis, and we drive up to Sacramento and test this game with the kids. It's a, an eight hour day to get in the car, get up there, set up, have all the kids come in after school, play the game, discuss it with them, take their feedback, and it is just completely and totally probably the most rewarding thing I have ever done in my life. The kids are so inspirational. And What's most important is that as a part of this dialogue, they feel like they're part of the design, that this game is part of their journey in life. If we never touch anyone else beside these kids in this room with this game, I would die a happy person. But, you know, maybe if we're lucky, we'll make a game that's really fun, and people will want to play it, and at some point we'll release it maybe to a public beta, maybe it'll come out on iOS. There's really, the sky is the limit. But as Ian was saying each day, and how their steps count. Making games is an incredibly difficult climb of an incredibly steep mountain. There is a ton of uncertainty and a lot of effort required in order to make a game. So as Ian says, it's kind of crazy to make one to communicate a point. Um, what I have found is that applying commercial game development processes to these types of games, at least to the one that I'm making right now, has been incredibly successful because it's about a dialogue of creativity, both among the people on the team, with the researchers, and with the kids themselves. And I'll be honest with you, I expected to feel pretty good about doing this work. And they did this work because I thought, all right, I'm do 20% time giving back to someone, to something, because before I die, I would like to have done that. But what I didn't expect was that this would really infect phenomena and kind of infiltrate every aspect of what we've been doing. I just came back from E3, the different three E's, the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles, um, where I announced that uh, Phenomena is going to be bringing Keita Takahashi and uh, Bikram Subramanian onto, uh, into our company to work on a new game. Um, Keita designed a game called Katamari Damashi which I am like the world's biggest fan of. I actually have a Calamari license plate on my car. <laughs> and there's a whole long story about how we became friends and why we're working together, but that's not really important for you guys today. What's important is that Keita has this immense and contagious interest in childhood and play. His work is in the permanent collection at the MoMA. He was featured in the, the Century of the Child um, exhibit there. And um, he's really interested in exploring the scale of objects and the way that we play with one another. Um, as children than as adults. Um, and what I found is that in discussing the new project that we're working on, which for him was inspired by time spent with his two-year-old playing with blocks, that we have really been able to leverage, and I hate that word, but it's true, leverage a lot of the discussions that we had on this little tiny not-for-profit game that we're making and talking about this 
commercial game that we're going to be making. A lot of the same themes are emerging. Um, so the small 20 percent time project is informing the big commercial project. Ostensibly, the game is about these three characters who you've been seeing through the slides, uh, a mayor and two deputies. But beyond the fiction and the mechanics of this experience, the game is a sort of statement, I think, about values. It's a little bit like we're trying to find the right place for the same messages that we are seeing in this collaboration with the NSF. It's become part of this ongoing conversation that we have about our values as a company and the ways in which that we can build games that engage your curiosity and therefore make the world a better place. Several people today have mentioned experimental and independent games that were made elegantly, in my opinion, that made a difference. And Ian's right, we might not always hit the mark with the stuff that we're making, but I truly believe that we can. I believe that excellence is within all of our reach. It's within your reach. And that's because I believe that there really is no difference between a game for change and a commercial video game. Every game makes a change. With each statement we make as an industry, we change the world. And that's with big games and with small games, with violent games and with nonviolent games, with collaborative games and competitive games. Each of them has a place in the discourse, and so do you. Which is fucking fantastic, <laughs> right? Um, the last 10 years have been so incredible for us, not just with the kinds of technologies that we have access to and the kinds of tools that we have access to. So really, the only thing that we have to make sure is that we have fun while we're doing it. Thank you. And so I have about 10 minutes for questions. Is, is there a need for G4C? Is there a need for the serious games genre? I'm kind of anti-genre in general. So I think when you start to think about uh, something like a video game, what you should think about is scaling. Um, it's something that I've said in many talks that I've given in the past and will always probably be saying until I sound like a broken record. Um, so really what I think Ian was trying to mention with this idea of earnestness um, is that your, sh your work should come from a place inside of you that is, is motivated. Um, I actually pitched a pedometer-based game to Electronic Arts when I was working on The Sims. I read an article about uh, escalating rates in childhood obesity while I was living in San Francisco in like 2006, and it just broke my heart. And then I heard through friends of friends that Nintendo was going to be developing cartridges for the DS, I think, that had a pedometer in them. And so I got super excited and I designed a whole game and I went to the boss's boss's boss of my boss and said, like, can we please make this? And, you know, in the end, the conversation ended up being about cost of goods. The cart was more expensive because it had a pedometer in it. And, you know, no one buys third-party DS games. And it ended up just becoming about, like, the fact that you can't really sell that game, you know. And within the structure of Electronic Arts at the time especially, it was not economically feasible to make this game, and it wasn't considered um, enough of a marketing win to really, or a PR win to really do it. And so, yeah, you know, the pitch is probably sitting there somewhere in their bin. Um, but it was something I really cared about. Like, I thought about it constantly, and I've talked to people about it several times. And in fact, the grant that we're working on right now, I developed uh, with Ari Hotera here while I was living in LA. Um, because I was like, if you're gonna do a game, then like, make a pedometer game. I've always wanted to do this. And literally, like, I quit my job and started my company, and a week later he called me and said the grant had come through. It was just kismet. It was just totally bizarre. Um, so I have always been wanting to build this game, um, and that's where it comes from for me. It's something that I just think would be fun to try to work on. Um, if all of your games come from a place like that, then I think that would be great. It doesn't really matter if we get together and call it Serious Games Summit, or we call it Passionate Developers Summit, or 
Ernest Gamers United. I mean, it doesn't really matter what we call it. Um, well, all, the only thing that matters is that it comes from inside of you. And I really believe that. I really do. Someone else? Could there ever be too many Ernest Games? <laughs> The question is, could there ever be too many earnest games? Well, are there too many shoegazer albums? You know, is there too much goth music in the world? Um, are there too many sensitive paintings? I mean, I don't know. Maybe. I think there's room, there's room for everything. I love to play fun games. I played the crap out of XCOM, the most recent XCOM that came out. Um, and I will play it again, because I will finish the game with an all-female kill squad. I totally will. <laughs> my side was a dude, so I had a one, one dude on my all-girl squad. But um, I really love to play video games of all kinds. I'm not saying that you know because a game has violence in it, you shouldn't play it. I just think that there should be um, really heartfelt feeling in each one. So I don't know, maybe you should think about that next time you work on a game like that. How heartfelt is it? But yeah, I mean, it, we're never going to get to a place where people don't make games just for fun. Um, if you're looking for something like that, uh, Super Pole Riders, which is going to be coming out on the PlayStation 3 as part of the um, Degut and Fabrique's uh, awesome game pack, uh, is definitely worth checking out. It's totally cool and completely silly. Questions? Anything back? Yeah, there Yeah, so this is a good question. The question is, you know, essentially there are so many games coming out for the App Store, for example, every day. Are we going to get to a place where people are intimidated or stop trying to make games because they just won't get played? Um, I think the answer to that is definitely no, because passionate people that I know in the experimental games community, uh, Michael Burrow, for example, who does a ton of really great experimentation in multiplayer games, doesn't really give a crap. He's doing it because he's exploring the idea of what games are. He's an artist. So even if there were no market for it, much like, I mean, really, if you're in commercial music, there's very little market in some ways compared to 10 years ago. People still make music. They still do great shows. I still am super excited to go see the Unknown Mortal Orchestra next month when they come to San Francisco. I mean, there are still people out there that are fans of medium and will, and will pay to see it, will pay to play it. But I do think, that there is an opportunity right now for console publishers to embrace the kind of content that we're talking about and create a safe place in their ecosystems for it. There are a lot of people in a living room somewhere, and it would be nice if they could get this stuff without having to swim through a sea of stab you in the neck faces or um, invest in it on Kickstarter. It would be nice if some of the larger console publishers and some of the investment groups took some time and a little money and helped us out. I think that would be very nice. Uh, what advice would you give to people who uh, are aspiring game developers who want to do triple E type of games? And then I would ask, what, what platform do you recommend for someone who's starting out? Okay, so the question is, what would my advice be to a starting developer who's interested in doing triple E games, and uh, what kind of platform would I recommend? Um, my first advice is always just to start making games, because the first few games you make are usually pretty crappy. Ian and I have both made crappy games, <laughs> and you know, it's just something that you do. It's like the first few poems you write, or the first hundred, whatever that rule is. Um, and the other, the other advice I always give a curious um, and interested uh, developer is to get out there and experience life. Like there's just not, there's no substitute for having lived. And then you port to iOS, Android. If you have a game that would port to something like a handset, you're going to reach a lot of people. There are so many people out there in the universe that have a laptop or a tablet device or a phone. And Android, especially right now, is incredibly rich in opportunities for people that want to get out there and get noticed. The thing is, is as, as this gentleman said earlier, the content aggregators and people that actually have the stores and stuff can be difficult. So the other thing you have to do is 
meet people early, show your game early, bring it to festivals like this one, like IndieCade, uh, PAX is a great place to show off games early and get feedback from fans. Always be reaching out to the people that will play your game. Know who they are and love them, and they'll love you back. I mean, I think the worst thing an independent aspiring developer can do is lock themselves in a room and work really hard on something for five years and then just release it and expect someone to notice. That never happens. It's, it, the, the discovery methods for that are, are very difficult. Even I, uh, running experimental gameplay workshop, I can only really get to maybe 300 games total by word of mouth and submission and just constantly playing and asking other people about games. And I know there are games every year that I, that I could have known about but I didn't know about at the time. So you really have to get out there and kind of show people what you're doing. Don't be so shy. Yes? Yeah, I'm coming from the opposite world. I uh, run a nonprofit for climate change and we're uh, Fantastic. at 500 schools nationally. And uh, we have a grant to, uh, says we want to get a digital game, a mobile app game, and expose these kids and other kids to climate change action. Uh, but we're in the Bay Area, trying to find the gold rush mentality. It seems like so many of the great development firms are, you know, want their own IP, they don't want to do work for hire. It's a very fragmented market out there. I'm wondering, you know, do we need advice? Um, Okay, yeah, that's also a really good question. Um, essentially, what this woman is asking about is the fact that uh, in the Bay Area, especially right now, if you want to work with a developer, like as a nonprofit, to get some work for hire done, it can be incredibly expensive. Uh, the developers are very picky about you know, owning the IP and stuff like that. This is a really difficult problem because most experienced developers, especially in an area like San Francisco, have been hired away by companies that are very, very um, atavistic about profits. Um, you may be lucky enough to find people through groups like the IGDA, so the International Game Developers Association, that would be willing to volunteer um, some time on a project, not, not to be paid, but to volunteer, um, or to work with a younger group of people, students or someone who um, has access to students out of the school, for example, like Santa Cruz, um, working uh, with those students on the games. But the cost of that is that you have less leverage with those developers and things are slower. Um, it's time consuming to make a game, and especially programming is very, it's a very hot commodity right now. So I think that the only thing you can do is make yourself very transparent about how much you can afford, what your goals are, why you're trying to do what you're doing, and find people that are inspired to work with you because of that belief. It's the sort of same thing that we've been saying up until now. Um, Phenomena is right now just myself and Martin, and we collaborate with four other people. At some point, we'll sign a deal, and then we'll have some money, and then we'll pay everybody, and it'll be great, but I don't take salary right now. I'm living off my savings and what I made on the journey because I care about it. And I think there are a lot of people out there who do have well-paying jobs, especially in San Francisco, working for larger companies, but maybe aren't as fulfilled or haven't really been able to scratch their itch when it comes to something like climate change. I know there are a lot of people that worry about it. So it's just about flying the flag and finding those people. I do believe they're out there. The search is hard, and you always have to have someone with experience helping you, because if you don't, you run the risk of hiring someone that doesn't know what they're doing. And that's just good business sense. Have an expert on your board, someone who's made some games, who cares about your cause, um, who can help you. Yeah. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Everybody.